back to Fast Keto. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Will Cole joining us on the podcast today. And we had him on the show about this time last year when he came out with his first book, Ketotarian, and he just came out with a brand new book called The Inflammation Spectrum, Find Food Triggers and Reset Your Immune System. So on today's episode, we delved into inflammation, what it is exactly, breaking it down to how it manifests in the body, what autoimmunity is, what are some of the different reasons why autoimmunity manifests. We talked about the gut lining, permeability, and endotoxins, and how important the structural integrity of the gut lining is for ensuring optimal hormone function and how inflammation in the body can block our hormone signaling. We got into all of that on today's episode, including how he personally has evolved his keto diet from when he first started. We talked about weight loss and fat loss and so much more. I know you guys are going to love today's episode. So if you enjoy it, share it with someone that you like, hit the like button and share it with someone who you think might benefit from knowing more about inflammation and autoimmunity. I would love to hear any comments or feedback that you guys have about today's episode. So leave a comment here and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. I hope you guys enjoy today's episode with Dr. Will Cole. All right. Well, welcome back to Fast Keto, Dr. Cole. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's so exciting to have you back on a second time and this time to talk about your brand new book that's all been going. Thanks so much. Yeah. So I've been working really hard on this book for, for a while now. And we see patients around the world and I've done that sort of virtual functional medicine practice thing for the past 11 years. So I've seen a lot of different cases, a lot of difficult cases. And I tried to sort of boil uh, these commonalities that I've seen uh, in my functional medicine practice in my new book, The Inflammation Spectrum. Uh, so the inflammation spectrum itself is a concept that I talked about in my first book in Ketotarian, uh, which we talked about on the podcast the first time. Um, but it's the the book the inflammation spectrum was uh, allowed me to have a really a, a fun deep dive into this concept of inflammation and how it exists on a spectrum and how it impacts so many people uh, in so many different ways and uh, allowing people to find that so they can really target what their issue is uh, and then it's sort of this choose your own adventure uh, way to use food as medicine to calm inflammation but then also this non food stuff that impacts inflammation and imbalance in the body. So uh, I'm excited about it. Um, and it, yeah, it comes out October 15th. It's on pre-order now, depending on when people are listening to this. Uh, yeah, so that's what it's all about. Now, let's talk a little bit about what inflammation actually is, because it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If we want to break it down to a really simple concept, there's a difference between sort of acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Is that right? Absolutely. So inflammation is a product of our immune system. So in balance, it's a good thing. It fights viruses, it fights bacteria, it heals our body, it repairs things. So that, that is proper inflammation. Uh, and the, the problem is, as you said, it's, it's chronic inflammation. It's the, it's the breaking of the Goldilocks principle, not too high, not too low, but just right. And with inflammation, you want it just right at the right time and then to calm down when it's not needed anymore. The problem that most people find themselves with in the West today, across the United States and Europe, across the world really, uh, is that they're in a state of chronic inflammation, which is sort of like this forest fire burning in perpetuity where it's not going down when it should be going down, and it's creating problems. And because our body is so brilliantly interconnected, it's impacting like, inflammation in one area can impact other areas and we're made up of cells and obviously on the cell membrane that becomes more oxidized because of inflammation and then that impacts mitochondrial function and triggers DNA which is inside the cell, triggers genetic predispositions for issues. And then we look at the st statistics that we face today as a society where we see you know, 50% of the United States is insulin resistant or pre-diabetic or diabetic. 50 million Americans have an autoimmune disease, millions more around the world. Look at the rates of heart disease and cancer and uh, it list goes on and on to things like 
anxiety and depression and brain fog and fatigue, these mental health and cognitive issues, people think mental health is separate than physical health. Well, mental health is physical health. And f there's a physiological reason why people have mental health issues in most cases. Obviously, there are mental emotional components that impact physiology as well. But this commonality that that either something in the body is driving inflammation, impacting mental health, or stress and trauma in increases inflammation as well. So in inflammation is really the commonality between all of these issues uh, that we face as a world today. So it's definitely near to my, dear to my heart. These are the people that I deal with, seeing patients. Uh, and I really uh, wanted the person that maybe doesn't want or need to have a functional medicine doctor in their life, but that can pick up a book and start making positive action steps in their life today to start improving their life. Now, is it because you're a functional medicine practitioner that you focus so much sort of on the root cause of different conditions? Yes, yeah. So that's what my, my day job is, is, is looking at labs and digging into the components of what's driving that inflammation up. So it's looking at the inflammation to get a baseline, like is where the inflammation is coming from. So we run labs like C-reactive protein or homocysteine or ferritin to look at acute phase reactants or we look at gut centric inflammation and then other things that can drive inflammation like viruses and chronic infections and molds and hormonal imbalances. It can kind of perpetuate these metabolic syndromes and things like this. So yeah, my job is uh, I'm fascinated and intrigued by everybody's unique case and finding out what's driving their specific imbalance. Cause that's what we're talking about when we talk about inflammation, it's inflammation out of balance. Uh, that's that's the problem. Now, why is it that so many people, in your opinion, in the world today are dealing with chronic inflammation? I think if you look at the studies and the researchers that are looking at namely autoimmunity and you look at this larger autoimmune inflammation spectrum that I talk about in the book, and I think you can then extrapolate that to other chronic degenerative issues like diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. It's largely a mismatch between genetics and epigenetics. So our genetics haven't changed in about 10,000 years. Over 99% of them, like almost all of them, haven't changed. But yet our world has changed very dramatically in a very short period of time. So this mismatch between our genes, our DNA, and the world around us, our genes are living in a weird new world <laughs> as, as, far, as far as they're concerned. Uh, and this is triggering genetic predispositions that have been there for 10,000 years, but are being triggered and awoken like never before because of the onslaught of epigenetic environmental lifestyle things that we wield, largely we wield control over. So it's the foods we're eating or the foods we're not eating, it's exposure to toxins, it's uh, biotoxins, it's, it's the stress, it's sleep, it's all of these epigenetic things are constantly and dynamically instructing genetic expression and turning off genes and turning on genes and all of this stuff. So this is what the larger picture of why we're seeing epidemic rises of chronic and autoimmune issues. So when we talk about gene expression, basically our genes are this code that enables our body to print proteins. Is that right? So we could break down maybe some of these concepts a little bit more, epigenetics, and what is it about our lifestyles and diet that is triggering our genes to be maybe printing or expressing the wrong kinds of proteins, or you know, maybe we could delve into that a little bit more and break it down. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the lo when you're looking at, again, this mismatch between what we do in our life to that our genetics, the, these toxins or these xenobiotics or these uh, foreign substances that our genetics are in alignment with, it is denaturing our DNA. It is, it is um, turning on genes. So I think of gene genetics and DNA and genetic predispositions as sort of a light switch. So these things that there's out of alignment with our DNA they tend to upregulate these bad genes and express them. So someone can have the worst gene predisposition for certain problems, but that may never be turned on. 
Uh, and a lot of most of us have genetic predispositions for certain things. It doesn't mean that everybody in the world is going to get that certain thing. Or just because it's in your family doesn't mean you're going to get that problem. So DNA is definitely not our destiny in that way. But research estimates that a third of this sort of inflammatory puzzle is genetics. And then two thirds is epigenetics. So for example, like in functional medicine, some of the labs we look at is, is genetics. And that is a definitely a slice of that puzzle. It's a third of that puzzle of w how long somebody lives and how, how's their health during their life, their, their quality and quantity of their life. Um, so we look at that one third. So we're looking at things like methylation impairment. So we're looking at things like MTHFR and MTRR and COMT and the VDR, all these gene SNPs that basically, as you said, they're making proteins, they're making enzymes to facilitate a certain function in the body. Um, then we look at detox impairments like CYP1A2, like these, the more impaired somebody is genetically, they aren't, maybe their body isn't as good at detox detoxing uh, because of these gene SNPs. And we look at things like APOA and APOE uh, gene SNPs that how are they metabolizing certain fats? Um, and then we're looking at, at, at all these sort of components. We look at cannabinoid genes too, that different cannabinoid gene variants can make some people more sensitive to lectins and food reactivities and oxalates and these sort of food sensitivity issues. So that's the third of the puzzle. We can't ignore it. But so much more of that is epigenetics. There's all these other things that are triggering these genes. Or if you're like the another analogy that I use is the cup analogy. So we're all born with different cups. Like some people have big cups, some people have small cups. And that's our genetic tolerance to stressors. And some people, their cup will overflow pretty quickly. It's the foods, it's the stress, it's the toxins, it's the sleep, the lack of it. And that can overflow pretty quickly. And then some people have really big cups and they can smoke like, pack of cigarettes a day and treat their body really poorly, but they'll live a long life. Uh, and it doesn't seem fair on a level of standing, but we can't change our cup size, but we can put, decide what we put into it largely. So my job is to teach people, okay, how big is your cup? How big is your genetic tolerance to things based on genetics and you know variants like that? And then also, what are you putting in your cup? And we can start emptying the cup and lowering inflammation and bringing balance to the body. Try out the keto diet with me as your coach and guide. You can check out the Ketogenic Girl Challenge at www.ketogenicgirl.com and I will be your coach and guide. Studies have shown that people get to their goals and results much quicker and much more successfully if they have a support group or they have someone doing it along with them. And I'm here to be your coach and guide when it comes to keto. So if you've been doing keto for a while on your own and you're just not seeing the results that you wanna see or you're brand new to this, let me share all of my knowledge, information, and expertise with you and check out the Ketogenic Girl program. It is at ketogenicgirl.com and I would love to have you join us. Those are some really great analogies and really helpful, you know, to convey some of these concepts. If we go back to the triggers and the causes behind this inflammation that we're seeing, you mentioned autoimmunity. So let's talk about the link between inflammation and autoimmunity and why are we seeing such astronomical numbers in terms of people with autoimmune conditions? Yeah. So um, it's estimated again that the, there are 50 million Americans with autoimmune disease. There's about a hundred different autoimmune diseases that we know today as this, they, that science recognizes as a full-blown autoimmune disease. So seeing things like MS and uh, celiac disease and rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, lupus and Sjogren's and Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, Hashimoto's thyroid uh, disease. These are autoimmune diseases. Breaking that word down, auto, autoimmune disease itself, when the immune system attacks the self. Uh, so the immune system sees the thyroid or the brain or the, or the joints or the muscles as a foreign invader and starts attacking them. And there are millions more that are somewhere on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum, meaning they're not fitting the criteria for diagnosis in mainstream conventional medicine, but they are somewhere having this an autoimmune inflammatory reactivity. Mm -hmm. So there are three stages on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum that um, there's silent autoimmunity, meaning if you ran some labs, maybe you'd see something positive. 
but they're not noticing any symptoms. And then there's autoimmune reactivity, meaning they're having symptoms, but they're not bad enough to be stage three, which is the full-blown autoimmune disease. Uh, but the criteria for diagnosis for those health problems are pretty like end stage, like meaning that the, there has to be about 70% destruction of the myelin sheath before it is bad enough for them to catch it on an imaging study and call it MS, 90% destruction of the adrenal gland before it fits conventional criteria to, to call it Addison's disease or autoimmune adrenal disease. That's across the board for most autoimmune diseases. It's going on about 10 years prior to that diagnosis, things were brewing. That inflammation was brewing. And that's similar to non-autoimmune issues too. Like for example, like type 2 diabetes, if someone's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, that didn't happen overnight. It's about seven to 10 years prior to that di diagnosis that you can start seeing these the storm on the horizon, the inflammatory storm. So the reason why uh, for autoimmunity, the rise of it, is going back again to that mismatch between genetics and epigenetics. That's a large part of it. But if you're looking at the sort of seminal event that researchers are looking at, I would say it's a confluence of, of, of different factors. That perfect storm, again, to use that storm analogy for inflammation. But a lot of researchers are looking at the intestinal permeability being a major component, meaning that it's probably not an issue for every person with autoimmunity, but it's so common that you want to look there because it's so closely associated with triggering autoimmune conditions in most cases. So it's basically the intestinal lining. It's supposed to be protective, but for these people, there's a more permeable uh, membrane, more permeable lining than you want, uh, and things are passing through the gut that shouldn't be able to pass through the gut as most of your listeners and viewers will know what they call leaky gut syndrome or increased intestinal permeability. So undigested food proteins like dairy and grains and other foods and um, uh, lipopolysaccharides. These are bacterial endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria. A lot of people have dysbiosis and balances in their gut because of the environmental and food changes. Again, a mismatch between genetics and epigenetics. So bacterial toxins with lipopolysaccharides Undigested food proteins can pass through the gut lining into the bloodstream. And then at that point, the immune system says, whoa, why is there undigested food proteins and bacterial toxins from gram-negative bacteria in the bloodstream? And then it starts creating uh, antibodies and tag. Those are basically flags for destruction. And then the immune system creates a sort of cytokine inflammatory cascade attacking the foreign invaders or the things that's leaking into the bloodstream. And then there's this phenomenon that researchers refer to as molecular mimicry. It's sort of the case of mistaken identity when the immune system says, okay, let's attack this, this, this food protein or bacterial toxin, and then sees the thyroid that's similar enough in structure on a molecular level and starts attacking the thyroid in the case of Hashimoto's disease or the myelin sheath in the case of MS and so on and so forth. When you talk about the different uh, areas of destruction when it comes to autoimmunity, there's over 140 different autoimmune component issues. So yeah, that's the one mechanism there. But again, autoimmunity tends to be there's like an X chromosome link component, meaning more women than men sadly have autoimmune disease. Uh, it's outnumbers by, you know, I think 10 to one. I mean, it's very high, mostly women for most autoimmune diseases with a few exceptions. Uh, things like ankylosing spondylitis tends to be more men, but most autoimmune conditions are female dominant, sadly. So there's this um, component where this X chromosome is, is an issue there. But again, it's being triggered like never before in human history because of this onslaught of epigenetic factors. It's so amazing when you think about how powerful the immune system is and how it has these responses that you were describing. It has, you know, this primary and secondary, the innate immune system, and it'll go through and tag cells, like you were saying, for destruction and sort of flag them and put this flag out outside the cell so that the antigens, you know, all that can be recognized. But to think about that, how powerful we see the immune response in our bodies, to think of that being turned against us, you know, yeah. literally being our own worst <laughs> enemy yeah. uh, is really sad. And so knowing and understanding this, I'm, I'm really glad that leaky gut is getting a lot of you know, recognition and that you are mentioning some different tests for it because I know it has been sort of questioned as a theory, although we do see the endotoxins 
we can actually see how those are escaping the gut, undigested food is escaping the gut. So is it possible to actually look at the permeability or assess the permeability level of the gut wall? Uh, yes, there is. And obviously this is an advanced, um, uh, an evolving science or uh, sort of the cutting edge of diagnostic. And there's no perfect lab out there, but we live in an awesome time where more and more of these labs are becoming available and improving their sensitivity and their, their specificity as far as catching these things. So uh, yes, there's a, several, several labs. The most, the gold standard in functional medicine and integrative medicine and a lot of immunology uh, like Arishta Vijdani and these, these amazing brains when it comes to autoimmune and inflammation, uh, Cyrex lab is still one of those you know, gold standards in the space of functional medicine. Uh, and we measure the proteins that govern gut lining permeability. So it's a blood test. And we drop ship these labs for people around the world. Typically, we would coordinate a local lab to them. And the lab is drawing the blood and then currying it to the lab uh, in Phoenix is where Cyrex is at. And there's other labs like Dunwoody that do similar biomarkers too. So it's not just Cyrex. But um, basically, these labs are measuring the proteins that govern gut lining permeability. So if your immune system is creating an immune response against, against occludin, or zonulin, occludin, it, yeah. So occludin is the protein that basically occludes the gut lining, and zonulin we think of it as a, a zipper, zonulin zipper, and things are passing through the gut that shouldn't be able to pass through the gut when it comes to these gut gatekeepers, occludin and zonulin, and then we can measure antibodies to lipopolysaccharides as bacterial endotoxins. So one could assume uh, that if your immune system is creating an immune response against bacterial toxins in the blood there's been a breach of intestinal permeability. So these are two good ways, if not great ways, to gauge uh, intestinal permeability. But it's important to, to mem remember that those labs and all labs, even conventional labs, are a snapshot in time. So they're when you got the lab at that moment, where are things at? So our body's constantly in flux. It's, con it's like a, the ocean. It's high tide and low tide. And where are you getting that snapshot at that 8 a.m. when you got that fasting blood sugar on, you know, whatever day in the morning on that, you're, where are you at the other 23 hours and 59 minutes where you're not being tested for that blood test or that stool test or that hormone test? It's important to put it in context with your health history and get a really good solid health history and then retest. And sometimes those, those are needed too. But definitely labs are a piece of the puzzle to give people answers as to why they feel the way that they do and, uh, and explain to them the mechanism as to what's going on in their case. So is there such a thing? It seems like everyone is trying to, in sort of the traditional medical approach, to eliminate inflammation by giving people, telling people to take like Tylenol every day or like, you know, anytime there's inflammation, you have to take a pill and, you know, get rid of that inflammation. Yet we know that inflammation is serving such a beneficial purpose. So how much inflammation mm -hmm. is kind of a good thing we were talking a little bit about about that acute amount and when does it become a problem when is it a situation where you would recommend someone look into having some of these tests done yeah that's a good good question so it's back to that principle of the goldilocks principle you don't want it too high but you also don't want it too low immunocompromised people uh tend to have really low inflammation and their body can't fight off infections if they're on immunosuppressants or they're on steroids or like these things that artificially lower the immune system that's not a good place to be in either they're more prone to infections and colds and flus and being really sick mm -hmm. so you need a healthy balance inflammation levels uh the problem for most people in the west is that it's too high so we're having the conversation of balancing it out but there is obviously people that have too low inflammation either so for example like homocysteine is one way to gauge that it's an inflammatory marker. We want it under seven. So we want it somewhere, you know, around six, five, that would be optimal. But above that, it's not good. It can increase blood brain barrier permeability. It can act as a neurotoxin and uh, increase basically what they call leaky brain syndrome. Uh, as somebody can have leaky gut syndrome, they can have increased blood brain barrier permeability, which researchers again are associating with different neurological issues like autoimmune, neurological autoimmune issues, uh, anxiety, depression, brain fog, fatigue, that kind of stuff. Um, and that goes on for any inflammatory issue. You want to make sure that it's just right at the right time. Um, so for people that, I would assume most of the people that are listening 
and or at least if if they're not going through something, they know somebody in their their family or their their friends that the problem in most cases is too high inflammation. So at that point, that we need to sort of recalibrate. So matter no matter where we're at on this inflammation spectrum, we need to sort of bring balance through our body. Uh, and that's really the bigger picture is no matter where you're at, let's bring balance. Uh, and that's not a quick fix. That's not a simple like Instagram like pretty sounding quote. <laughs> it takes time. It takes effort. It takes thoughtfulness. But that hopefully I can bring some of these functional medicine pr principles in the book so people can start taking action on their health because most of the stuff, people can start moving the needle in a positive direction just by themselves and learning about their body. So speaking of that, what are some of the most powerful interventions that people can do to get things back into homeostasis or back into balance? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I would say the first thing that you're going to want to do is find out where you're at on the inflammation spectrum. So in the book, I put a quiz uh, that we adapted from questions that I ask patients. It's, so you take the quiz. There are seven main sections on the inflammation spectrum that I write about. There's the brain, there's the gut, there's the hormones, there's the blood sugar systems so of the insulin system, which is a hormone, but I separated it as different from thyroid and female hormones and cortisol. <laughs> Um, and so on and so forth. There's seven sections. And then there's the interconnected section, meaning our body's interconnected and someone that has area of problem and a problem area in one area, they can have problems in other areas or what I call poly inflammation or many areas of inflammation. Um, so taking the quiz, which again is adapted from functional medicine principles that I ask patients. Um, and then based on their score, they can find out, okay, this is like hormones are a more problem for me. Uh, or my gut's a bigger problem for me. Or maybe it's my gut and my brain and my hormones. And then I gave them specific toolboxes in the book so they can kind of personalize that process. Um, and then based on how high their score is or how low it, there's different tracks to calm inflammation levels down. So it involves a personalized toolbox and then a plan based on their score. And this allows the person, the reader, to use food as medicine specific to them uh, and to calm inflammation. So I would say doing a personalized elimination diet approach is how I advocate it in the book. So to, the, the goal is to finding out what your body loves and your body hates. And I'm sure all of your listeners and viewers know this is that you know they'll read something online or listen to a podcast, but they try it and it may not work for them way that it did for somebody else. That's bio-individuality. And that's really the heart of functional medicine is that what works for one person may not work for you. So the goal of the inflammation spectrum plan in there is to find out what works for them. So under the paradigm of the ketogenic diet, for example, like I love eggs. Uh, many people like dairy. Uh, but does everybody work with well with dairy? Does everybody work well with eggs? No, not. Some people have inflammation from this because of intestinal permeabilities or things like that are higher FODMAPs like avocados, a great keto food creates some digestive stress for some people. Um, and you know, raw vegetables can cause digestive problems for some people. So I start allowing people to self-discover and self-experiment what foods make them feel the best, whether they're under the paradigm of keto, under the paradigm of paleo or they eat whatever the heck they want. I want them to find out what their body loves and their body hates and try to minimize, you know, broad sweeping overgeneralized statements that work for some people, but not necessarily you as the person that's listening to this right now. So that's what I tried to do through the system in the book. Now, I know that one of the things that you recommend is doing elimination protocols. So I want to dive into that a little bit. But also, one of the questions that I've been having for a while now is, you know, and I think we're still trying to understand the gut a lot, you know, including the microbiome. But what is your opinion on the requirement for fiber in the diet with regards to the gut microbiome? Because there are some doctors out there who believe that the gut microbiome, looking at certain studies, just shifts, it changes if there is less fiber. And then there's other opinions out there that basically, uh, the you know, you can create SIBO or you can get gut small intestinal um, bacteria overgrowth from not feeding the microbiome fiber. And so it, it then starts to cannibalize the gut lining. So I'm curious if you, you know, what your opinion is on mm -hmm. elimination diets and 
you know, that connection to, you know, eliminating fiber because that can often, you know, mm -hmm. be a big uh, game changer for people. Totally. So, it, and this is something that is really at the heart of my practice where I see patients online is that anything's fair game when it comes to like real whole foods, like healthy foods. Like I've seen really healthy things flare somebody up and then the next person obviously it does great things for them. So um, what I wanted to try to boil down, obviously I'm not consulting the reader of the book, um, so I can't know their specific case, but it's, I, I, I've been able to sort of take these truths and these common links through the quiz mainly. They can kind of find out what, what their specific issue is. So for example, fiber, it is a wonderful thing for our gut microbiome. Our bacteria eat what we eat, the microbiome, it's trillions of bacteria. Basically, it, depending on the study that you look at, we have about 100 trillion bacteria. Some studies say less, and we have about 10 trillion human cells. So we're about 10 times more bacteria than human, sort of like sophisticated host for this microbiome metropolis. And you have these colony forming units that are like cities of bacteria. And you need these cities to be well fed because the bacteria then take that and they eat what we eat and they produce amongst many other things like neurotransmitters, like 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut and stored in your gut. It's your second brain. It's your gut is your second brain. It's formed from the same fetal tissue uh, and it's inextricably linked for the rest of our life to the gut brain axis. And if you think about it, the intestines even look like the brain or resemble the brain in many different ways. So it's the second brain is referred to in the scientific literature. Anyways, we have all these neighborhoods, colony forming units of bacteria within the microbiome and research shows that the more diverse someone's microbiome is with good op beneficial bacteria or probiotics, it's associated with more abundant health and lower disease and a longer life, basically. And a lack of bacterial diversity is associated with more problems and predispositions for health issues and autoimmunity and things like that. And when you don't have the good guys or the probiotics in high amounts, that can allow opportunistic bacteria like those gram-negative bacteria that I talked about, pathogenic bacteria, uh, and yeast and fungus like candida and parasites and opportunistic and pathogenic things. They're basically, these are like weeds overgrowing in this gut garden, so to speak. Um, so the checks and balances are off when the good guys are lower. The regulatory system are off when your good guys and the bacteria are lower. So... It's important to understand the context of the specific person you're talking about, and that's where a good health history or inventory for yourself on a personal level, level comes into play. But fiber, the bacteria eat fiber largely, and they produce short-chain fatty acids, uh, which are basically end products of bacterial fermentation that helps to fight cancer and bring inflammation levels down, improve brain function. And one of those, one of those short-chain fatty acids is butyrate. Butyrate is related to beta-hydroxyurate. So your body endogenously makes that through fermentation of fiber. So that's a good thing. And you're right. Many studies show that long-term, low-fiber diets, high meat, high di dairy, high saturated fat diets tend to impact the microbiome in not so good ways for many people. But the flip side is there are some people, when you give them a high-fiber diet, they feel horrible. They have, it flip bloats them up, they feel their, their, their inflammation comes up, their digestion's off, all that stuff. So what are they supposed to do? So my goal in the book, and obviously in my practice, I can obviously run labs and get find specific to the person, but I want people to find out where they're at on the inflammation spectrum, and let's just say they are, their digestion scores are higher. Well, I tend to recommend a lower fiber diet and cook things and have lots of soups and stews and calm things down so you can repair your gut. So eventually, and by eventually, it may take weeks or months or years before you can get to the place where you can handle fiber-rich foods. And then you talk about what type of fiber you can have. So a lot of times they can still have fiber. They just have to be lower fiber and go for lower FODMAPs and uh, like lower sugars and fiber by its very definition and is a carbohydrate. So we want to look at the nuances of what type of fiber they're, fiber they're focusing on um, that not having these gastrointestinal inflammatory symptoms. So the goal is 
to get them to the place where they can have like real foods and eat like non-starchy vegetables without a problem um, or eat starchy vegetables without a problem too, depending on the case. Um, but that takes time. And because we have an epidemic of gut problems in the United States and around the world and Europe as well, that this is going to take time sometimes. Some yeah. people can have it right out of the gate. Some people can't. It's important to know what's right for your body and what's not right for your body. But as you heal, what you used to not be able to have, the goal is to be able to reintroduce these things as your body heals. So the carnivore diet, for example, it's the ultimate elimination diet because it's removing a lot of these fibers. But the goal isn't to, to be carnivorous forever and ever, even though maybe some people would prefer that. But the goal is to use something like that to drive down this inflammatory cascade to bring things back in as long as it's nutrient dense. Um, and there are studies to show like the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, they have good bacterial diversity during those months where they are eating less vegetables, but they're eating more raw meat. They're getting like drinking blood and doing things that most people that are on the carnivore diet in the West are not doing today. So there are other, there are other ways to get bacterial diversity beyond fiber. I would just say it is the most common, most well-researched way to get bacterial diversity. Yeah, I also was curious, um, I found this list of prebiotic foods that were non-carbohydrate um, that included cellulose, cartilage, collagen, um, fructo-oligosaccharides, glucosamine, um, rabbit bone hair, skin, um, glucose, there's like a bunch of things that are, oh, there's also casein. Um, but these tend to be some of the foods that actually have some of the highest prebiotic content. Uh, so it's interesting. I think if someone has less tolerance for fiber, they can also explore some of these other product prebiotics. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of elimination is, is it possible um, that someone could do elimination I guess I should ask you, what is the best way to do an elimination diet? Because I know that a lot of people do it incorrectly by eliminating too many things and reintroducing things too quickly. And mm -hmm. what is the best way to not lose your ability to process certain foods? You know, if you eliminate them and then, you know, I'll see people who are carnivores say, well, I reintroduced this food. And now that I'm carnivore, I can see right away how bad this food was for me because I had this reaction. And I'm thinking, well, maybe you, you're not sensitive to that food, but now you are. You know, so I wonder what your thoughts are on that and on you know, doing elimination protocols properly and reintroduction so that you don't yeah. lose your ability to you know, break yeah. down certain foods. Certainly. Yeah. And that's a valid point and an important point to bring up. And I think when someone does the, a, a proper elimination diet, how I advocate it in the book is to, for the lower scored people on the quiz to do it for four weeks and then the lo higher scores, which I would assume would be a lot of people would do it for eight weeks. So I tend to want to do eight weeks for a bigger differentiation between like a baseline to where you're at upon reintroduction. So it allows that inflammation to calm down. So the microbiome is going to shift during that time. Whether you're doing an elimination diet for four weeks or eight weeks, you're obviously eating nutrient-dense foods. You're focusing on foods that tend to be lower reactivity. Um, you're well-fed. You're well-nourished. You're sort of calming inflammation by avoiding foods, but also eating foods that, that calm down inflammation levels. Uh, but upon reintroduction, your microbiome is going to be shifted. So to your point, there is going to be less enzymes or bacteria that the body's producing or that's being produced within the microbiome that uh, to break down certain foods. But that's why reintroduction is so important because you're not having like a big bowl of something when you haven't had it for eight weeks. You're having a small amount and then you're working way up because what is that doing? That's telling the body to start producing certain enzymes. It's telling the bacteria to produce repopulate when it's needed to digest that food appropriately. So enzymatic production and microbiome production is allowing time to ramp up so you're not having this big bolus of whatever, grain or dairy or whatever right after eight weeks because that's not going to be a true sign because 
you know, a lot of people could have a digestive problem from that if you're having too much of anything you haven't had in eight weeks. So you're having a little bit and you're just kind of testing into it. If someone has a true reaction from that, from a small amount or a decent amount, that's going to be a clear sign that their immune system's modulated in a way that's not working for them. So for example, like if I didn't go off, if I went off of avocados for eight weeks or if I went off of something that, that like didn't bug me for eight weeks and I brought it back in, I would feel fine. I, brought, I wouldn't want to have a big, huge bowl of it, but I, if I brought it back in a decent amount, I would feel fine. But if I brought back a food after eight weeks that I didn't serve me well, I would know it. So as long as they're reintroducing modestly and how I advocate it in the book, then they're not going to have a false positive. They're not going to have a food that's like just because the microbiome is shifting. Uh, that's that's not going to happen because you're kind of leaning into it and foods that work for your body foods that your body loves you're going to feel fine eating them and you're going to be like whoa i miss this and my body loves it so let's bring it back in <laughs> um, but the food that does make you feel lousy you have that body language that body talk of knowing whoa i don't feel good on that and i'd rather feel better than avoid those foods so that's food freedom that's sort of taking off the shackles of dieting dogma and obsession about food and orthorexia and all these problems that I find within the wellness world, you know, for yourself, not for anybody else, what your body loves and what your body doesn't love. I'm curious, have you ever seen someone who couldn't tolerate something, say like eggs, and then they were able to after because of their gut health or villi or something being restored? Yeah, definitely. And that, I mentioned that in the book. And I say it to patients all the time. I'm a, like a broken record. I'm like, don't like fret about this now. Maybe we reintroduce too soon. Maybe it's like, maybe you need eight months, not eight weeks <laughs> to remove this food to, to heal your gut. And because it's, it's largely, if you look at the research and the mechanisms that at play here, we can uh, say that the issue is the, that intestinal permeability. So the albumin in the egg white or the casein in the dairy are passing through the gut that shouldn't be able to pass through the gut. And it's creating this sort of, again, this molecular mimicry, these inflammatory cascades, it can be a problem for people. But the gut research estimates takes about 18 to 24 months to heal for most adults with chronic inflammatory health issues. So that's a year and a half to two years to two years. Yeah. So that's for some people that takes a long while. So I can't tell you how many patients that I see where a year and a half to two years, they can bring a food back and they don't have a problem back. Now, technically, if you look at like the immunology and like cross reactive foods and foods that mimic gluten and people with diagnosed autoimmune diseases, they may not do well to bring ever bring certain foods back, back in, um, for these more or like clinical, like end stage cases, but a lot of people can try reintroducing it. It just may be too soon that they brought it back in. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about weight gain and fat loss and the connection with inflammation. Is there a connection there? And is it related to cortisol or stress levels? And, you know, what are some of your opinions on that when you have clients who come to see you and they have, you know, weight gain that they'd like to deal with? And, you know, what, what are some sort of your opinions on that? Sure. Yeah, that's one of my favorite sections in the quiz is that hormone section because it really illuminates for people like certain areas of focus that they need to, to consider. Um, so inflammation back many ways. Let's look at try to look at the main one. So the main system that we're talking about when your hormones, it's the endocrine system, it's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, and then the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian or testicular axis. It's the brain communicating with the adrenals, the thyroids, the ovaries, of the testicles. So we are uh, seeing that communication uh, through measuring certain labs when I see patients, but through like quizzes subdiagnostically, they can see okay more or less what may be the areas that may be uh, impacting my my body. Uh, so inflammation can impact the the brain's uh, communication with the uh, endocrine gland because if the brain has low grade inflammation, that's going to decrease the neural output from the brain to the thyroid. So you can have or the ovaries or the adrenal gland. So you can have what's called uh, hypothyroidism secondary to pituitary hypofunction, which is basically a fancy clinical way of saying the brain's not speaking to the thyroid. Right. Uh, and if your brain's not speaking to the thyroid, the brain's not producing either TRH or TSH. The brain's not releasing this hormone to say to the thyroid, hey, work 
because TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is a pituitary hormone. So it's supposed to say, hey, thyroid, wake. Oh, wait, wake up. But so sometimes you can see patients with normal, quote unquote, to low TSH, meaning it looks hyperthyroid. It looks overactive. But you measure T4 and T3 and free T4 and free T3, and they see, you see lower thyroid hormones. How could this be? How could you have a hyperthyroid looking TSH and low or functionally low thyroid hormones? Well, it's the brain not speaking to the thyroid. So inflammation can cause that. Things like viral infections can cause that. Things like chronic stress can cause that. Well, what does chronic stress and virus do? It brings up inflammation for the brain. So we can look at the HPT axis or the HPA axis, the HPO axis that way. But then Let's say it's not that. It's not a brain-based inflammatory issue impacting hormones, but then let's say it is the body producing the hormones uh, and then has to activate the hormones. So for the thyroid, we're using the thyroid as an example. Maybe the thyroid's producing enough hormones, the brain's speaking to the thyroid like a champ, but then the, but then the body has to activate T4. It, it gets its name from a tyrosine protein and four iodine molecules, and it has to activate T4 into T3. 80% of that conversion happens in the liver. 20% of that conversion of T4 to T3 happens in the microbiome in the presence of a healthy bacterial diversity that we just talked about. So if there's a problem with the liver, a problem with the gut, that can impact the conversion of T4 to T3. Well, inflammation in the gut, inflammation in the liver, like fatty liver disease or a sluggish liver or the toxins in liver can inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3. So then at that point, at that point, inflammation is impacting that. But then you, let's just say there's not a liver or gut problem. Let's say everything's happening from the brain to the thyroid, then the thyroid and the liver and the gut. But then the thyroid hormone is activated. It's T3. But then it goes and it tries to get on the thyroid receptor site on our cells. And every cell of our wonderful body has a thyroid receptor site because it's so important. The thyroid is the queen of all hormones. But the thyroid receptor site is blunted. So it's, it's, so it's a cellular receptor site problem. And inflammation blunts those receptor sites. So inflammation can impact all of those areas along thyroid hormone metabolism or just one of them. So we, in functional medicine, by running labs and doing a thorough health history, we can see like what that person, that's just the thyroid. Then you look at adrenal and it can impact the, the adrenal circadian rhythm. It can impact estrogen metabolism, looking at E1, E2, and E3, like all the different estrogen metabolites. Inflammation can, can decrease the clearance of those ex excess estrogens like estrogen dominance, estrogen progesterone imbalance will be off. I could go on and on. Inflammation can wreak havoc on hormonal balance. Now, what can people do in general? What are some of your, like maybe your top three tips for people on living healthier lifestyles that are less inflammatory prone and just, you know, reducing sort of the risk of having autoimmunity? Mm, good question. So if I say three steps and I try to be as broad as possible because I, the whole premise of the book is finding out what your body loves and hates and there's so many different options for people, but I would say the three like foundational principles. Number one, I talk about it a lot in the book, is that you can't heal a body you hate. You cannot shame your way into health. You cannot like punish your body into wellness that ultimately I think a lot of this stuff begins in your head and your heart and your relationship with your body, your relationship with food because stress and your life or stressing about food or stressing about your body and shaming yourself will raise inflammation levels up and it will be a saboteur to a lot of things you do in your life. So I think people need to heal their relationship with your body, with their body and food first. So I think that's, Easier said than done. I mean, it's for sure. I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but I think it's a core thing to get at one. And then number two, I would say find out specifically where they're at the inflammation spectrum so they can make targeted changes instead of feeling overwhelmed like they have to do all the things. They just need to do the things that are almost relevant for them so they're not wasting their time. And then third, I would say to, re to find the foods that make them feel well. Because after that, when you start, you, you transition from doing another diet or another program to really just knowing, hey, this food makes me feel lousy. This isn't punishing my body by avoiding it. Mm. I, I actually want to feel better more than I miss that food. So it's gaining that food discernment and that food wisdom 
that you know embody wisdom to know this food just doesn't work for me. And then they can have that freedom to go about their life. So those are three things. They're more broad, but I think those are like the infrastructural things that people need to go through to find out, um, to do something about inflammation in their body. Those are great tips. Now, you and I talked a little bit about first coming from vegetarian lifestyles, you know, well-meaning teenagers discovering, you know, veganism and vegetarianism. And I'm curious, because we talked a little bit about your approach to keto. How has your approach personally changed and how have you evolved your keto uh, diet since you first started doing this I know you're always learning you know you've written two books now what are some ways that you've evolved your personal approach that's a good question too uh, uh, I give myself more grace now uh, and I I, I talk I've talked about this on keto talk I've talked about it on goop fellas the other podcast how I do a cyclical uh, ketotarian, like mostly plant-based, but still uh, like a vegetarian, like a wild-caught fish, fresh seafood approach with grass-fed beef when I want to have that. Um, and I have the MTHFR SNP. So I basically, I eat more intuitively now than I did years ago. And if my body, if I feel good on something, then I'll, I'll eat it. And I, I check in with my body on those things. But to get discernment on what works for your body and what I had to do for myself and what I would advocate the listener to do is you have to calm inflammation levels down because inflammation that's high, your blood sugar will be off, your hormones will be off. You won't have clear body discernment because is it body discernment or is it erratic blood sugar? Is it body discernment or is it imbalanced hormones? Because at that point, you don't know if it's just the craving is actually what you need or it's actually, uh, or if it's just some in you know, hangriness is not body discernment. <laughs> it's not. Uh, you yeah. need clear clarity to know where you feel the best. Um, so for me, it's like I might. I just took. I have to stay on top of it because I have autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family. I have the MTHFR gene step, which means my body's not that good at bringing inflammation levels down. Uh, so I have to eat on point. And if I don't, I don't feel as good. So I know. Okay, I can. I can be more loose. I do a cyclical ketogenic approach. I feel good with it. Um, and I go right back to being producing ketones and being fat adapted because I built that metabolic flexibility that I talk about in ketotarian. And I know you talk about it too. So people can find out what works for their body instead of feeling like they're a failure if, they, if it's not ketosis all day, every day. They're not a failure. They need to find out what works for their body and still use the amazing application of a ketogenic diet as their foundation because they have to get fat adapted. Most people aren't there. So get fat adapted. And then from there, is the cyclical approach appropriate for you? Or is the cyclical approach not appropriate for you? Because like for someone like Jimmy Moore, like a, our friend and like my co-host on Keto Talk, he couldn't do a cyclical approach. Mm -hmm. So I know it works for me, but it's not going to work for Jimmy. Yeah. So uh, it's to me, it's it's giving yourself grace and lightness and not feeling like you're a failure if you don't do like the thing that the zealots in the community say you need to do. <laughs> I love what you said about inflammation and clarity because I've been looking into that more about, you know, our endocrine signaling and receiving those signals and how inflammation can block that signaling in the brain yeah. and hear over and over people in the keto space and low carb space say i have mental clarity you know i have this yeah. mental acuity and i always thought that's coming from you know the ketones and you know these anti-inflammatory effects they have but you know I, I never thought about it from that you know specific point of view so that, that's really really cool and it's such a good point that taking care of that first and then listening to your body. And then it can become this fun game where you're like, do I crave sardines today? Am I craving mackerel? Like that's so interesting. You know, maybe my body needs some of those anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids or, you know, you can kind of just listen to those signals more. But like you said, dealing with any inflammation first so you can yeah. hear those signals. So uh, true. A lot of sense. So that's awesome. So show us the book. Do you, do you have yeah. Have it I have there? it. It's the galley, but uh, it is like tons of. Oh, that's pretty beautiful. Things. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna be hardback book, um, and yeah, I'm really excited for people to check it out. It comes that's out October fifteenth, and it's on pre order now. 
That's really awesome. I'll definitely put the link for people to pre-order that. Now, tell us a little bit more about where we can follow you online. So you have um, a couple of podcasts and also just where are you most active uh, on the social feeds? Sure. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. I really appreciate it. The um, Everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. We have Actually, I didn't mention this. We have the inflammation spectrum quiz that I've been talking about through this episode. Ooh. We have it at drwillcole.com. So they don't even need to buy the book if they don't want to. They That's can awesome. just like take the quiz and kind of see like what they would score at if they're curious. Um, and you can pre-order the book there. We have video classes. We offer, again, functional medicine support for people around the world. We primarily have a virtual clinic. So we just do webcam consults and drop ship them labs. I, we just launched this group class project that we've been working on for the past year. Really excited about it to make functional medicine more accessible, more affordable to people around the world. So I'm really excited about that. But yeah, everything's at drwillcole.com. And I'm probably most active on Instagram and Facebook. So it's at drwillcole, D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E. Now, I listened to the podcast of Jimmy, and what's the other one you said, Goop Fellas? Yeah, so um, Goop is Gwyneth Paltrow's wellness brand, and the main Goop podcast is hosted by Gwyneth and Elise, the chief content officer, and their first spinoff is Goop Fellas, which I'm hosting Goop with cool. Seamus Mullen. Yeah, so it's like a life transformation podcast uh, conversation. It's called Goop Fellas. It's like a plan where it's like wellness gangsters. <laughs> and uh, it, we're talking about addiction, vulnerability, and health, and all the things from a guy's perspective. So a new episode comes out every Wednesday. That's awesome. And I love that quiz that it's on your website. I'm definitely going to yeah. go check that out and put it in the notes here for everyone to check out. And I have to ask you, have you influenced Gwyneth at all towards keto? <laughs> She loves Ketotarian. She awesome. uh, she loves Ketotarian. Yeah, she has it. She actually wrote a blurb for the Inflammation Spectrum. Um, but yeah, she she like I know as much. She's explored it. I don't know how much she does it on a regular basis, but she's definitely open to it uh, and loves Ketotarian. Awesome. Well, it's a fantastic book. I can't wait to get my hands on your brand new book. Congratulations on writing that. That's a lot of work and time and energy goes into that. So. Uh, appreciate it an awesome contribution thanks for being here with us again yes and anytime. All great knowledge and information thank you so much doing the ketogenic diet and you're just not getting the results that you want to get or your results have slowed or are you brand new to keto i am here to be your personal support and guide and coach you to your goals and results you can go to ketogenicgirl.com and check out the ketogenic girl challenge it comes with my specifically designed meal plans i've been doing keto myself successfully and i lost over 40 pounds i made all the mistakes when i first started so i can help people avoid mistakes when they do keto if they've hit a stall if they're not getting the results that they want to see or they're struggling with some aspect of keto, I am here to share my knowledge and expertise in nutrition. I am a sport nutrition specialist and I also am studying biomedical science and I am here to be your coach, to be your support and guide and help you get the results that you want to see. So I would love to have you join. You can go to ketogenicgirl.com, check out the 28 day ketogenic girl challenge and I would absolutely love to have you join the group and be your coach and support and guide. So go and check that out today. That's ketogenicgirl.com, the 28-day ketogenic girl challenge.